So yeah, is it working? Can you hear me? But I cannot see you, so I guess that's okay. So, oh, it's here. So I'll be talking about uh, the internals of FastAPI. I thought the title was a bit bigger than this. I had some other stuff. Well, doesn't matter. Uh, I'm talking about the internals of FastAPI. I'll give the full cycle of how things happen from receiving the data from the client and getting to the server, the application, and then going back uh, to the client again. Uh, I am Marcelo. I'm from Brazil. Uh, I live right now. <laughs> I live in the Netherlands. And what else? Uh, yeah, I work at Pydantic, uh, data validation package. And I'm also the maintainer of Youthcorn uh, and Starlet. Uh, one is a web server, and the other is one of the dependencies of uh, FastAPI. Uh, hey, man. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'll be talking about FastAPI. And what is FastAPI? Uh, just general overview. Actually, who have never used FastAPI and it's here? OK, 5%. Uh, OK, who is from Brazil here? Okay, one percent. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, anyway, so FastAPI is a web framework. Uh, it has two dependencies, Pydantic and Starlet. Starlet is responsible for the web-related technologies that FastAPI uses, and Pydantic does the data validation that comes in and comes out from the uh, from the framework. Also, does the generation of uh, the OpenAPI JSON that you use to see the cute swagger documentation that people like. Uh, it was created in 2018, uh, and I am part of the community since 2020. Uh, oh yeah, you can run FastAPI. You need to run FastAPI. You need a web server. One of them is Youthcorn. You just run Youthcorn main app. There are alternatives. There is Hypercorn that's created by Phil Jones. Uh, he's one of the maintainers of Flask. He also maintains the Hypercorn. And there is Granion, which was created by uh, an Italian guy called Giovanni. It's made in Rust. People like to know that nowadays. And <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is pretty much what I'll be talking about. How the data comes in from the client, goes to the server, and then goes to the app and goes back. Uh, but I'll be focusing more on the server to the application and coming back because that's, uh, that's what's the internals of FastAPI. Like we want to know how the data comes in, what FastAPI does, and how it comes back. So I'll be focusing on this part. Uh, so how it really happens. Uh, there, are, there was, um, well, there is one spec called UASGI that uh, specifies how the server needs to communicate with the uh, s uh, application for sync, non-async Python uh, that uh, is used for Django, Flask, and uh, other previous time async web frameworks. And then there was a new uh, spec called uh, ASGI that was created some years ago, I think maybe 2017 or 18 or some around those times. Uh, and then it tries to match what is you ask it, but for async, and that's uh, that's the spec that FastAPI is based on. Like it uses uh, what is written on this documentation. This is also uh, as a maintainer, like I go to the reference all the time here, but I guess most of the people don't because uh, well, it's more low level than what people are used. So. Yeah, so this is the format of how an ASCII application looks like, and this is actually how FastAPI looks like really underneath. Uh, FastAPI is, if you see this app, it's a callable that has uh, three parameters, a scope, uh, receive, and send. A scope, uh, it's the connection data, so it's a dictionary with all the data from the connection, and the receive and send are two callables to connect, communicate. Ciao, Patrick. Um, to communicate with the, uh, with the server. So you need a way to communicate with the server, receive data from the server, and send back uh, to the server. So you use the receive and send uh, columns. And so fast API, the fast API object is also, uh, also is a callable and has this format. 
Uh, this is the most simple ASCII application that you're going to find. Uh, you might find it very simpler than that, but then it's not mm, as correct as this one. So this one has, you have the content type, you have the content length on the header, uh, and then you have a small body, which is just hello world. And then we have, we are using send uh, twice. We're just going to send uh, first the HTTP response. Where is it? Is it? Is it work? I don't know. So the HTTP dot response start is one of the messages, which you just send the status and the headers. Uh, so an interesting thing about this is that some servers, they behave different regarding when to send the, the headers and the status code. For example, uh, Hypercorn, you first do all the processing of the request and send back the response, and then it's when it sends the, the status code and the headers to the client. But for example, uh, so it waits the, the second message to send all the data. But Ufcorn, for example, when it receives the HTTP response start, already sends to the client. So what can happen is, for example, you send back the 200 you're having using the streaming response on FastAPI. You send back the 200, and then you have an error. And then, well, if you have an error and there is an exception on the server, that's what's supposed to be uh, a 500. But uh, it's too late. The client already received 200, so you see 200. But you also, if you go to Sentry, oh, or Logfire, you see some uh, uh, exception there, even if the status code was 200. Uh, yeah, but this is the most simple ASG application you're going to find. So this is the scope. As I said, there are three parameters from the, for, an, for our ASCII application. There is the scope, the receive, and send uh, uh, callables. This is how the scope looks like. It's just a bunch of information about the, the request in the, in the connection. So you can see the server and client IP there. And you can also see the HTTP version and uh, the path, the parameters, everything you receive that makes sense to pass and have on the, the application. And and we use some of those information to, like, we make this cute for the users to use FastAPI. For example, the headers, you just use the, the uppercase header, and then you receive the, the date, for example. And then, so, what happens if we saw the first example, this example, we just send, the, the, we just send from the application to the server with the send, and then the server sends back uh, that data. But you can also receive uh, a body from uh, the client. And the server will receive that, that, that data, they receive the request, and then it sends back, it sends to the, to the application an event called hp.request, which is used uh, to read the body. And what you see down there with the cir uh, circular form is uh, how this looks like, how this event looks like. So it's HTTP request, you see the, the, the body, how it looks like, and you see if it receives more body or not. This more body is just to, to check if, uh, if, you're gonna, if the client is streaming data to the server. And yeah, this is how it happens. You the, serve, the, client, the this application processes the HTTP request and sends back an HTTP response start and then HTTP response body. And then now it starts the part that uh, I stop being boring, and then I start talking more about how Fast API really works, in, and it's interesting, and you can use at work. So, you have uh, the middleware stack. So, again, you have the server, and you have several middlewares, right? Uh, and then you have the application, so it runs server, middleware, and application. And if you have multiple middlewares, you have multiple middlewares in the middle, and then you have the application. Natively, uh, no, sorry. Uh, so for example, on this code, you have two middlewares, the custom middleware and another custom middleware. So what's going to happen is that you receive the data on the server, the server sends to the application, but then it passes through those middlewares, passes to the custom middleware, and then another custom middleware, and then it goes to the application. So this is how really it looks like. So natively, uh, Starlet has two middlewares, the server arrow middleware and the exception middleware. The exception middleware 
it's used when you have the you know add exception uh, handle exception handler and then you have something so that's what the exception middleware is for so you have a specific exception and you want to convert to a specific response to the client so this is where where it happens uh, so if you have an exception on your endpoint you go it goes up and you handle that uh, gracefully like you send something useful to the client but then if you have an exception that's not being handled anywhere then it's handled by the server error middleware. Some exception happened, you didn't know what it was, and then you are able to see the trace back on, the, on your logs because of the server error middleware. And then it also handles uh, sending back the 500 to the, to the client. Uh, because we want to send something to the client to, to just make it aware that something happened. So how it happens, the server it has this flow. So if something happens on the application, it goes back, which means that if you send back the response from the application, it also goes back. So you can see the data that's being sent on every point, and you can check, for example, the headers on one of them, or you can process something. Uh, and then after the middleware, you have uh, the routing. And what happens here is that, again, you have the server, you have the middleware, you have uh, the application is being called, and when the application is being called internally, you choose which endpoint is going to run. One inter interesting thing th here is that uh, you see that the, the choice of the endpoint, the root, comes after the middleware. So if you need some information on the middleware, about which endpoint is going to run, you actually don't have it. And you don't have it because the flow is, is, is like this. So you have first the middleware that's not aware of what comes after. And then you have uh, the choice, the routing, and the choice of the, the endpoint that you want to run. This is actually one issue that we have uh, in Starlet. People sometimes complain because they want to see on the middleware, they want to have the data of which endpoint is going to run. Uh, it's also helpful for observability or something uh, like that because uh, we received some complaints some time ago that it, yeah, it's just going to be useful for observability tools to understand which endpoint it's going to run. And usually, if you don't want to monkey patch, then you'd use uh, a middleware on their side to check which endpoint it's going to run. But anyway, this is the flow. And so I have one example here of uh, two endpoints, line 6 and line 11. I have a pathparam name and I have another endpoint that's slash potato. Okay, if I call slash potato, which endpoint it's gonna run? Who thinks is the first endpoint? Raise your hands. Okay, who thinks is the second endpoint? Raise your hand. Okay. So actually, the endpoint that's being called in this case, it's the first one. And the way it works is the first match is the first one who runs. So this is a very common uh, issue that happens when you start coding with a fast API. You're like, opa, why is this happening? Is this framework dumb? But it, this, is, uh, this is, was uh, not a choice, but it happened a long time ago. It was just how it was. We, the first we match, it's the first runs. Uh, some people have been asking to, uh, to get an error if that happens, if you, like, if when you are registering the, the, the like, calc doing the rejects, calculate, compiling it, to check if there is someone that will match you. But, uh, yeah, there were some complaints. There was no, no implementation, so this is something you need to be aware. Sometimes you are trying to reach an endpoint, you don't see any messages actually because another endpoint is being reached, which is the case of here. And yeah, so we talked about the middleware, middleware, and then there's the routing. And then after that, uh, we go to the endpoint itself. So we have here the red root, read root. And then here we have two parameters, the A and B, which are two dependencies. And then what happens is that uh, it goes up to call the dependency. So a calls dependency A and B calls dependency B, and both of them calls the dependency called dependency. So if 
if I call this, then what is it? I'm going to call, and then, so if I call A, I'm going to call A, and then it's going to call dependency. And if I call B, it's going to call dependency, and it's going to call dependency as well. But then, who thinks the number of called is going to be two? Raise your hand. OK, cool. But it's going to be one. So you run this, and then uh, you call A first, and then dependency is being, the result of dependency is going to be cached, and then you call B. B is called and then dependency is called again, but uh, then this is already stored. So this is the one, the, the value that was returned is the one we use. The dependency works on the request response cycle, so it works once, and then on the next one, it uh, doesn't use the cache, it fills it again, and then you can uh, have the same data. So, so this is what I just said. You have A, sorry, you have the app, it calls A, and then it calls dependency. Dependency is store the result and the 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 hash of the the function is being stored on the cache, and then you call app, uh, sorry, you call call b again, and then it checks the cache if it's already there. It goes to to web band, and then you get the result. And then another point of confusion that's not written in any place is when you should use async or sync properly. Uh, is Thomas here? Thomas? No? Okay. Well, he teach me, he teach me a lot of stuff, uh, Thomas Granger. Uh, so I have these this two dependencies. They just defer in the fact that one is async and the other is not. Uh, so who thinks I need to use uh, the one in the left with async? Raise your hands. Okay. Who thinks I need to use the sync one? OK, so what happens is that, uh, by the way, the second people are wrong. The first one are right. So what happens is that if, <laughs> if I run this with, the, uh, with Fast API, uh, it will run it, if I run the, the sync one, it will run it on a thread pool. So this is just doing not very expensive threading I/O. there's doing nothing. So, Running in a thread will be more expensive because I'm using that thread than just having the, the, the first uh, code. Uh, so this is one point that it, there is a lot of mistakes happening because, for example, you see a lot of uh, dependencies that are just getting a header or computing some small stuff, getting the value and then doing some cleaning and then going back. So for those cases that are not expensive, uh, like that can run on the event loop, you should use uh, just async. It will not use uh, the thread, which will be more optimal. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah. And then, so we talked about the middleware goes to choose the which endpoint is going to run the routing, and then you see the dependencies. And then at some point, I have all the dependencies, and then I have uh, I get the data that's coming in from the. Uh, from the client, right, from the server, and then I need to validate the data. That's what Pydentic does for us. So for example, I have the, the input, which is a base model, and with that I'm validating that the body that I receive has two fields. It's a JSON format and it has two fields, a name and an age, name being string and age being an integer. So I'm just going to validate that that's really what's happening. So the types that I have really are what we have in the, in the endpoint body that we're going to use for uh, do whatever we need and insert the data in the database in this case. And then when it returns, uh, in this case as well, I'm getting only, I'm assuming the database insert returns the same data plus the ID. So you see the class output and I'm going to return that as well and it's going to make sure that everything is okay. The difference is that on the input, if it's wrong, Fast API will give to the client a 422, unprocessable entity. And on the output, what's going to happen is the client's going to receive a 500, and you as a developer on the server logs, you're going to see that there was uh, an issue. And then you're going to be able to fix it. So this is what happens. This is the, the wrap of it, things. You receive the, the data, you validate the data, you run the endpoint function, 
and then you send back the, the data, and then you validate what uh, it's returned. And I just want to mention shortly the, the WebSockets. Uh, WebSockets in FastAPI are mainly just uh, Starlet code. Uh, <laughs> and so you just put the, the WebSocket uh, type on, on the parameter, WebSocket, and then you need to accept the, the WebSocket handshake. That's why on line 8 we have the WebSocket accept. So you send back, uh, you tell the server that you need to tell the client that everything is good and we can start uh, web socketing, and then uh, you start exchanging the data. <laughs> uh, so on line nine and ten, you have uh, you iterate, iter text. Uh, this is not a very usual, like this is a new format on how you should write web sockets. That's actually mainly why I put it here on this slide, because uh, usually on the examples that you see online, you have while true and then. You, re you use receive text, but with iter text, it gets a bit more cute, so that's why I put it here. And then at the end of the exchange, uh, I just close the WebSocket, uh, and, and that's it. Don't forget to close the WebSocket, because if, you, if the client doesn't close it, and you don't send the, this last line 11, it will keep open uh, till the, the instance is shut down. Uh, I mean, if the client doesn't close it for you at some point. And so this is what happens. They accept just this, the, the WebSock handshake, and then you can start exchanging data. So I said about async and sync on the context of dependencies, but you... So on the, I think on the last talk in Italy, I gave the same talk, and I said you should only use sync if you have I.O. threading, or if it's a CPU-bound uh, task, if something like that. I said that, and that's true, but there is a threshold on where it's worth it to use one or the other. So it might be that you have this thought that you should use on those two, but then it happens that uh, when you actually run it, it's faster to use async than to not use it. So. Uh, there is a, uh, an environment var variable called Python a async IO debug that you can use and check if uh, the code is too slow on the event loop, and then you can, uh, at that point, if it is, then you can use the, remove the async and use only the sync, and then FastAPI will use the thread pool. I have created some tips on this repository. You just Google FastAPI tips. I'm Cludex on GitHub. And we have a booth. I am working at Pydantic. We've created a product called Logfire. It's an observability tool. It looks cute. We are there on the booth. And Samuel, the creator of Pydantic, is also there, so we can talk to him. And thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. We have a few minutes of Q&A. Uh, if you have a question, you can step up to one of the microphones. And while we wait for people to step up, there is one of the online questions. Um, and that was about the slide where you showed the name matching from the name and the potato. And the comment is, wouldn't a simple solution to this routing problem not be to root by how specific they are? So let's like have the string um, the potato one. match first and then have the brackets name because it's not as specific like a string. What do you mean, you mean changing the order? Like when, you had, when, you had when you had the order of matching so that the endpoint would match with the brackets, if you sent the word potato and you had a potato later, that would not match. If we can't solve this within seconds, then we'll take questions from the room. <laughs> I can Please. answer that later. <laughs> uh, hello, I also I, have a, um, a question about the routing. Uh, for the custom routers that you can uh, add to a fast API, if ha you have a router with prefix, is the prefix itself resolved before for resolving the uh, uh, whole URL? So for example, if I have two routers with the same prefix, 
will only uh, views from the first router be uh, accessible and from the second not, or all uh, views should be accessible if they don't have colliding URLs uh, down the line? You mean like, for example, if I had potato and something else there? If like I potato. have like uh, added uh, registered uh, routers itself, like yeah. two se uh, uh, separate routers, yeah. and inside of them I registered uh, views with uh, uh, not matching um, URLs, but the routers itself has the, uh, have uh, the same prefix. Yeah, so for example, the same prefix can be uh, name here and potato, right? Or you mean and slash something else, or you mean potato and potato? Uh, I don't mean in the view itself. No, no I understand it's yeah. on the router, but you mean, yeah. like, for example, if I have name and then potato and then that will match and I have something else after. That's what or, I mean? Or, uh, or if they are uh, even uh, perfectly the same, I, I don't know, you have a router with V1 and other is also V1 because okay. you register it somewhere else in your code. And then? Uh, will it match only the first router or will it, like, progress through the views so if the views... No, no, it's going gonna, it's gonna to find everything. Okay. It's going to find everything. The thing is, if you have something else, it's going to find everything. Okay. If you just have, at the end, you have those two, then it's just going to match the first one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And the microphone here is empty, so please ask the next question from there. Hey, thanks for the talk. That was uh, interesting. Could you pull up the slide you had where you did the database insert? Um, yeah, this one. So um, I find... I often have a similar pattern where I need to, say, inject some database controller or some other instance into the root so then the root can, say, insert the data. Um, one thing I'd like to be able to do is inject the instance of the class into the root and have the, um, the framework kind of handle uh, doing that injection. Um, but I find... I haven't found a good way in order to be able to, say, inject like single instances of custom classes. So use some kind of workaround where, say, in, in the lifespan, I create my custom classes ah, yeah. and then store them in the state of the app and then create another route where I've got specify uh, as a dependency, oh, I want to take this instance from my app state and then and then I can use the depend kind of magic to get fast a API to inject. But I was wondering if there's something kind of yeah, clean there is, for doing that. Uh, Adrian, the other maintainer of uh, Starlet, he created this package called ASAPI. <laughs> uh, and he does something like this. Is it more or less what you want? OK, yeah. Uh, and then on the, he doesn't use the lifespan. He used something that he called binding, I think. Is it somewhere here? Okay. Yeah, it's binding. And then he binds it, and it can use this Qt injected on the, mm. on the endpoints. Okay, yeah. There, there was another package called uh, dependency injection that someone wrote that did something kind of similar. But the maintainer of that has kind of gone AWOL, so I'll, I'll check this yeah, but, out. Uh, this one is the maintainer of Starlet, so. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the question. That's all the time we have now. The only thing left is to have another great round of applause for our speaker. Uh, thank you. Thank you.